Hello, true crime and wine time friends. Thank you for joining me today for part two of Spider-Man, the Art Thief. Soon after Tomek cased the museum, he went to see Corvée at his gallery where they discussed his visit. Guys, I'm just going to say this just I find hilarious. Corvée offered Tomek $40,000 to steal from that museum the still life with candlestick painting by Leger, which was estimated to be around four plus million dollars based off of previous sales. Now, 40,000, 4 million. I don't know. You're taking all the risk. What do you think? I, it's, I don't know why you would want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, I, ego, I think we said earlier. Tomic agreed. Now, we mentioned this earlier, the dedication that Tomek had. He went back for six days, four nights, we should. So over the next six nights, Tomek walked to the gallery, hung up a black cloth to help shield him. And then he proceeded to apply a paint stripping acid to remove the paint, giving him easy access to the screws, which... Guys, I have to say that was smart because I would have just been taking the thing and like chiseling it like ice. But he then afterwards was smart and applied a chemical so that it wouldn't rust. I don't know if rust happens in six days. He then applied a chemical to help prevent rust and slowly remove the screws. Tomek was smart. He then used clay, but he matched the color of the clay to the window frame. So he was methodical. He thought about this. He then took the screws out, but I found it fascinating. He took this clay, put it in around the window frame, the glass frame to hold it up so that it would stay in place. He took his time six days to go. I mean, think of how many times he could have been caught in those six days. We're not even, he hasn't even stolen anything. Because we know the one window didn't have a camera. I am just sitting here thinking, six days. How did security guards not notice? The lapses in security are embarrassing. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I have no answer. I'm like, da, 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 da. Tomek, I mean, he was methodical and he made no mistakes. But on May 20th, now, if you remember earlier, guys, I mentioned it was May 10th. When he went in the first time, May 20th, that's 10 days. So he returned on May 20th to the gallery wearing a dark colored hoodie and carrying two suction cups that he used to remove the glass from the window frame, along with a few other supplies, which was probably in his fanny pack. After entering the window, Tomek used bolt cutters, so... It was much bigger than a Euro pack. Those <laughs> bolt cutters, I mean, they're kind of big. But he used that to cut through the lock securing the grate. So I'm visualizing that. You had to cut it, lift up, and that's how he was able to enter the museum. Now, upon entering, he went in and he retreated nearby and waited to make sure there was no silent alarms, which... He had not set off. I'm just glad on a limb here. They didn't have any silent alarms. And ask Sean, this sounds like a really poor security system. This is priceless works of art. What should they have had? <laughs> what have you seen? You're absolutely right. The Museum of Modern Art had let its security systems lapse. Um, Tomek discovered it at the time, and the museum became embarrassingly aware of it after the theft. Um, so as you had mentioned, right, he had found the blind spot um, in the exterior cameras. I mean, that, that seems pretty blaringly obvious to us, right? You would think you'd want, you know, a full camera coverage of the exterior. Well, he had found this blind spot where he was able to work on the window day in uh, day after day after day, 
as you said, several of the motion detectors, right, the, the lasers inside the museums, right, were insufficient as well. So you'd think there should be guards patrolling the interior and the exterior, and, and that obviously was not the case. So museums can um, and should use a variety of security measures, right, to protect their collection. And the most common, of course, um, are video surveillance and, and security guards. Um, but a lot of museums are nonprofits and they cannot afford, you know, the most sophisticated, and most up-to-date technology that they can. Um, I've been shocked in the museums that I've worked in and some of the, you know, uh, lapses, let's call it. Um, but they're nonprofit. How do you... How do you balance that? It's it's really, really sad. Um, and plus, as we hurdle into the future and technology becomes more and more complicated and the potentials for, you know, digital crime, um, it, you can imagine interfering with the video loops and the surveillance and the infrared systems. You can imagine how difficult that's going to be for for small institutions. Right, and nonprofits. That's almost impossible. I think of companies who spend millions for security because they make billions. How does a nonprofit pay millions to protect? The other thing, too, is like remember that human error comes into it, uh, technological breakdown. Right? Humans were flawed creatures, and <laughs> guards cannot stare at computer monitors every second without pausing right to chat about there's a coffee break or you're simply yeah. bored. imagine how bloody boring it would be like monitoring an empty museum after hours so of well it's going to be lapses and if you have a criminal watching you and you do the same protocol every day a desk dust or something like that in yeah. uh, the three months that i worked at one museum there were two major lo- alarms that were set off i um, putting the entire museum on shutdown and both or false alarms, or so we think. The The best advice I can give is museums need integrated security systems. So that is like a multiple security measures that function together and can catch a thief when, say, someone tampers with one particular security precaution or if, or if a, one aspect of the system goes down. So they need to be integrated, overlapping, and yet still function with each other. The other thing, too, is art theft is often really fast and difficult to plan for. So you think of all of the planning, right? Tomek spending days and days and days. But the actual thieving itself can be quite fast. One study found that the average art theft took only 58 seconds. Think about that. 58 seconds. So, for example, um, in 2003, the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna um, is undergoing renovation. There's scaffolding around the museum. Um, exterior. So one night, a thief climbs the scaffolding, smashes a window, and swipes a 16th century gold enameled salt cellar by the great artist Cellini. Right? The thing is worth $60 million, and it took the thief less than a minute to take off with this thing. How do you plan for that? Tomek was sure that he had not set off any alarms because, you know, he, he cased this place. And he saw the Leger, still life with candlestick, which he then removed from the frame, set the empty frame down, and rolled up the canvas and put it in his bag. Now that he had that painting, now that Tomek had the painting that Corvée had asked him to look for, it was secured. He looked around and he saw the pastoral by Matisse that stirred something inside of him. So he then removed it from the frame and placed it in the canvas bag along with the Leger piece. Now, I'm just going to stop here and say, reminder, he was commissioned to still one painting. He was an overachiever. He has achieved that. But then he became enthralled, almost manic, while in the museum, and he fixated on the woman with the fan, which he also removed from the frame placing the canvas in his bag and returning the frame to the floor. This makes three paintings that he has secured in his bag. But Tomek was one heck of an overachiever. He was not done. He went on to take The Pigeon with Peas by Picasso and the Olive Tree, the Olive Tree painting by Brock all of which he removed from their frames 
Tomek told Jake Halperin, the reporter at The New Yorker, that he almost stole a sixth painting. But, end quote, when I went to get it off the wall, it told me, if you take me, you will regret it the rest of your life. Tomek went on to say that he will never forget what the woman with blue eyes did to him. He said, when I touched it to take it from its frame, the feeling started instantly, a fear that came over me like an iceberg, a freezing fear that made me run away. Chills. It took Tomek two trips to get the canvases out of the museum because he'd only planned on stealing one. He didn't have enough room in that bag. Luckily, he had parked his car nearby and escaped without anyone seeing him that night. I I find that amazing. A hundred plus million dollars you just stole. Two trips to his car. And we're not even finished yet. So, Sean... What do you think of Tomek's success to this point? Why stop at five paintings? Right? <laughs> you spent all this time breaking into the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. What? Yeah. There's other things in that museum I would have gone for, too. But I guess he cleared out a certain room. I'm in awe that he got away with it. But he could have damaged those paintings by removing them from their frame. Why didn't you just take it out in the frame? Especially if you're going to make a couple of trips. <laughs> That's what I've wondered, too. I mean, at that point, why not just haul out the five canvases as it is? So for your listeners, um, canvas paintings are usually attached to what's called a stretcher. It's, the, it's like a wooden frame behind, that holds the canvas, and it's either stapled or, or nailed to this little wooden stretcher. And then that whole thing is placed inside of a, of a frame. So what thieves, like what Tomek did is either rip out or in some cases cut the canvas. And that is a real catastrophe. Um, Imagine sort of roughly taking a knife, right? Slicing away at um, uh, the middle of the canvas. Well, once it's actually removed from that wooden stretcher, you can then roll them up. And believe it or not, for a large part of art history, that is actually how canvases were transported. They would be removed from the stretcher and rolled up and stored that way. Now you can imagine, right, the damage that it would do to the actual painted uh, surface. So it causes additional cracks. It causes the pigment, right, to become very loose. And you're obviously going to lose um, uh, pigment when that, when that happens. So it's catastrophic. Um, and museums often are kept at a regular temperature and things like that. So you can imagine right, being stuffed into hot bags and into a car, in the trunk of a car, and then out of it again. And it, it, it's, it's catastrophic. So if he truly loved art, would he have really done that? Again, or is it I'm ego dubious. again? Yeah, I'm dubious that he, he actually is that much of an art aficionado or whatever. Um, and maybe, I mean, when your life's on the line like that, are you going to roll up a Picasso? I don't know. Well, but his life would. wasn't on the line. He was sent in to steal one painting. Maybe ego got the better of him. One of I my favorite stories know. about rolling canvases um, is a great painting called The Execution of Lady Jane Grey by Paul Delaroche from 1834. The most spectacular painting at the Paris exhibition of uh, the 1830s and 40s. Well, it sold for a record price to this um, to a Russian aristocrat who then later down the line it sold to a British aristocrat. Well, it fell out of style and people don't, you know, you're not going to hang old fashioned art, you know, that isn't in, in mode anymore. So it goes into the basement, it's out of sight, out of mind. Well, they lost the painting. Don't know where it went. Well, it wasn't until the 1970s that they discovered this thing wrapped up inside of another canvas. And so imagine rolling two canvases together. Well, they used the Dolorosh painting to protect the other one. So it was used as a canvas liner <sighs> to protect the other painting. Well, miraculously, the other painting disintegrated and became um, uh, covered in mold and all that. The, the, the painting actually fell apart and Thank God the painting that survived was the Dilla Rush. And you can see it today in the National Gallery in London. It's beautiful.
beautiful. The other thing that is interesting, this theft was not noticed by anyone that night. That included three security guards at the museum. Now, there's some interesting theories online about who actually discovered the theft. I'm going with this one. It was discovered around 7 a.m. by the staff. The museum immediately closed for the day, telling the public there was a technical issue. That technical issue, we will find, was that they knew that the alarm system they discovered two months ago was not working correctly and it was not repaired correctly. I'm going to say the insurance company had a lot to say about this claim when it was filed. What do you think? That must have been a super awkward conversation. (laughs) I mean, we're talking $120 million potentially. How do you tell the insurance company this? That I can only imagine. (laughs) I can only imagine. So I got to ask you about art theft. Tomek was successful in stealing these five paintings. And he met up with Corvée, who had commissioned him to steal the paintings. But Tomek took those additional paintings, which all of the records and articles I could find made Corvée nervous, which I'm nervous. You're paid to steal one thing and you do more. How do you think Corvée handled that? I, again, I don't know if it was just in the thrill of the moment and you're here and you, this painting speaks to you and you got to take another one. Perhaps he didn't think or, or if he just thought like, hell, if I can sell one Leger, I can sell a Medigliani while I'm at it too. I mean, if you uh, think $40,000 each for five, not a bad payoff. You can imagine how unnerving that was to the other guy, right? To Corvée. Oh, Corvée. And we're going to hear Tomek and Corvée were both extremely nervous as the police and the mayor were on the news and told the press and everyone they wanted everything done to find these paintings. Corvée had paid Tomek to steal that one painting, and he did it by paying him in a shoebox with 40,000 euros. Tomek told the New Yorker that he was paranoid that the police would find him. There was more publicity than he thought, and everyone was looking at him. Tomek says he took three of the paintings to a female friend he trusted. What I find interesting is that we've got a person that we think is a narcissist. He's not only stealing more than he's supposed to, but he's involved with a sex worker. The interesting thing I found, the only information and leads the police had was a physical description given to them by a skateboarder. Now, for the next six months, the police looked around, followed the few leads they had. They got zilch. However, as oftentimes happens with true crime, they were following a lead in a different case. And that informant was good. So in October, based off the informant's lead, the police began eavesdropping on Tomek's calls. The police overheard Tomek ranting about the cops thinking he was the one involved with the museum theft and that the paintings had been sold. Police also felt Tomek looked very similar to the description given to them by the skateboarder, and they just kept eavesdropping. This was in October. Nothing happened until December 2010. The police were still following Tomek. In December 2010, the police followed Tomek to the Centre Georges Pompidou, which houses a large public library and the largest modern museum in Europe. Tomek is once again casing his next target. The next day, Police were still following Tomek, and they followed him where they witnessed him purchasing suction cups, gloves, and glue. The police then called Tomek, but got his voicemail with a greeting that is shocking, at least to me. I also found it funny. And I'm going to say, quote, here's the greeting. 
If you want to buy paintings or works of art or exceptional jewelry, do not hesitate to contact me. Among the many paintings, there are five that are extremely expensive. (laughs) I'm not going to say, oh, my God, what the hell? Sean, (laughs) what do you think of this voicemail? Such confidence, right? It's all about the sale, right? (laughs) I mean, among the paintings, there are five that I stole from the Paris Museum of Modern Art that are really expensive. It's worth several million dollars. <laughs> Why didn't you just say that? I know. I know. Oh, once again, ego. Sadly, even with this, the police did not arrest him. Tomek started to get more paranoid and suspicious. When he tried to call Corvée and his number was no longer working... He got really paranoid. Luckily, for Tomek anyway, him and Corvée ran into each other. And Tomek says that Corvée did not look good and would not give him direct answers when questioned about where the paintings were. Tomek began to believe that Corvée was working with the police. Tomek secured evidence against Corvée in case he tried to pull a double standard and blame the theft on him. Corvée had sold the Leger, but the new owner returned it for a full refund due to the massive media attention. I would want a full refund. What did you, I mean, Sean, what would you think would happen? <laughs> Keep the receipt. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm going to have a quick sip. What did he think would happen? Do you think no one would notice that he bought this painting that was stolen and hung it on his wall. Covey did find a buyer for the painting, The Woman with the Fan. The buyer was 33-year-old Jonathan Byrne, a watchmaker with an art history degree. Jonathan Byrne completed the purchase and then proceeded to store the Woman with the Fan painting in a vault at a public bank. Guys? We're talking about a bank. You walk down the street and you put it in. It wasn't in a safe deposit box. He leaned this canvas up inside the bank. Would you do that, Sean? Again, like what's the point of having art if you can't look at it all the time? I don't get it. Corvée was a smooth talking guy, apparently, because he talked Burn into hiding the other four paintings behind an armoire. At his watch repair shop. Corvée and Byrne had this crazy thought. Seemed to think that if the art was sold during daylight hours at an open business, that the provenance could not be questioned. Something referred to as market ouvert. Yeah, believe it or not, this is a a real legal idea. Yeah, so it's called market ouvert, or it has a French origin, marché ouvert, and sometimes known as the thieves' charter. So it's this strange legal concept dating back to medieval England. Um, It's an example of what's called common law, which is kind of like unwritten old precedents that continue out of tradition. So the idea is that if an object is sold during daylight hours in a venue of open commerce, then its origins, what's called its provenance, they can't be questioned. Right? And then they also, if the object was stolen, then the idea is that the rightful owner could come out and claim it before sundown. And so for the sake of market expediency, right, cart, courts don't have to review everything. So it's like a simplified way of sort of dealing with these ownership questions. Well, this law was used to justify art theft um, until recently, if you can believe that. So in 1990, um, thieves stole portraits by the great 18th century painters named uh, Thomas Gainsborough and Joshua Reynolds from Lincoln's Inn, estimated to be worth over half a million dollars. And they sold them to unsuspecting buyers at a flea market um, for, if you can believe this, 200 bucks. Okay, did you say half a million dollars and it was sold for 200? 200 bucks at a flea market. But that now that is a steal. Really? 200 bucks? I guess the, these thieves couldn't find a buyer, right? How else are you going to offload this stolen this, this stolen art 
commodity. So yeah, ended up selling it at a flea market. The, the, this buyer buys it for 200 bucks, and it was only discovered when this unsuspecting buyer brought the things into Sotheby's auction house, wrapped his <gasps> garbage bag, if you can believe that, wrapped them up in a garbage bag and brought it into Sotheby's. And they're like, oh, this is stolen art. Um, anyway, so the law was finally abolished in 1995, uh, in England anyways. And oh, by the way, no, the courts did not allow the poor buyer to keep the paintings. He had to return them. That should be common sense. You can't steal it and sell it. <laughs> and if you sell it between this time and this time. Yeah, this outdated medieval idea. The thing that just makes me crazy, they still did not arrest Tomek until they received another tip. That Corvée was in possession of the stolen artwork and that he was the money guy. Tomek was getting desperate at this point because he had spent that $40,000 and he needed money. Why would you get a job? Now, I do have to ask, he was only given $40,000 for that one painting, Women with the Fan. Did he not get any advances on the other four? Apparently not they weren't a bad commissioned. negotiator. So Tomek started looking for his next place to break into. And one night, Tomek decided to break into an apartment where he found some valuable artwork, jewelry, and a crocodile briefcase with a false bottom. Interestingly enough, he didn't steal anything that night. He left and he came back because he felt there were more valuables in that apartment. Tomek went back to the apartment and estimated 15 times before he decided to take some watches at a Pissarro because he thought there was more valuables, but he did not find them. Interestingly enough, the owner, the person that lived in that apartment, he knew somebody was breaking in and he found it so intriguing that the person was coming in and not stealing anything that he didn't report him. Or changes security measures. If anything, we're learning about the weird idiosyncrasies of all these characters, right? <laughs> Can you yeah, imagine? Tomek didn't know the police had been following and tracking him. Police had to have reached out to him. That's a great theory, actually. Hoping I mean, to like further entrap or or catch him when he's on the way out with certain valuables. That's that's an interesting idea. Like I said, the police were following him, and he stole those couple items. The police arrested him in his apartment and did a search and they found the stolen items from his apartment along with other evidence. Cheers. Spider-Man Tomek is in custody. Cheers. All three men were tried together. The thing I find most enduring, Tomek told the court that these pieces of art were his works of art, basically saying that because he pulled off this perfect heist, they were his. Ego again. So Byrne turned on Corvée, and Corvée turned on Tomek. It's typical. Blame the other guy. Byrne cried on the stand as he told of how he destroyed all of the paintings, and that he was devastated by what he had done. I, I mean, I'm just going to say BS. Everything I found online, not once up until he testified, did he show that. The great news, all three men were found guilty. Corvée was sentenced to seven years, burned to six years, and Tomek was sentenced to eight years. As of today, the paintings have not been recovered. I, I mean, there's lots of theories online. I've read that... The paintings are in Israel, maybe China. What do you think? I want to believe that they're still intact, that he didn't actually burn them, as he said that he did in a moment of panic. You know, we, we do do crazy things when we're in this sort of crazed panic moment. And so maybe he just thought, I need to destroy the evidence. But can you imagine lighting on fire $125 million of, in modern art? No, I mean, I just, I no, I can't, because that'd be like in a museum, walking up and lining. Ooh, that's... So maybe they're out there. Um, as you said, Israel is a lead. Uh, the, China is a possibility, but... Um, How would they get them there? Exactly. 
So yeah. that that's the part that makes me afraid that they actually ended up in the fire bin, to be honest. Or Tomek had one friend. Did he have another? If they were truly taped behind the armoire, did that armoire get sold, in, sold at auction? Check your armoires for Medigliani's, everybody. <laughs> And if you don't know what they are, somebody like me, I'd be pulling out. I'm like, oh, yeah, you either love it or you don't. So what I find most interesting about this case when I was digging into it is that this was not the first. In some cases I saw it was the biggest, but I don't know if I would call it the biggest because if we stop and think about, and I know there was a movie made, I don't remember the name but of Hitler taking artwork. Wouldn't you call that the biggest art heist? Uh, Without a doubt, yes. In terms of sheer numbers, um, the Nazi art looting is is incomparable. Um, The biggest of a a single event, the biggest art theft alone, is the the robbing of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which wasn't that long ago, actually. Um, It's a recent event. Um, it's the largest single um, art art theft in. Um, it happened in Boston, the former home of Isabella Stewart Gardner. She's this great female art patron in America at the time. Amassed this incredible art collection in her home in um, in Boston. And what happened in the early hours, two thieves were dressed as police officers. They buzzed the museum, saying that they were responding to reports of a disturbance. Well. The on-duty museum guards broke protocol, and they admitted these two, who immediately tied up the guards um, and put them in the museum basement. And there's actually photos of them being like t- showing them tied up with that silver tape. It's horrible um, down in the, the basement of the museum. Well, the thieves then spent the next hour looting the museum, the single largest um, value um, record art heist in history, a total of half a billion dollars in art was stolen. So they took 13 paintings, uh, mostly from the Dutch room, the 17th century Dutch room in the, in the Zibble at Stuart Gardner. Uh, they took a Vermeer. There's only one of, there's, there's only 34 known Vermeers in the world. So one of them now is missing. But they, uh, they didn't took, take just paintings. Correct. Yeah, they stole some strange objects, um, like a, a Chinese um, pouring vessel, uh, the top of a finial and Napoleonic eagle. They stole that as well. And so that's kind of what stumps the investigators is they don't quite see a rhyme or reason to the 13 objects that were stolen. Um, and plus, they're not the highest value works either. So there's Rubens and Titian, um, Raphael in the Isabel Stuart and they avoided these for these other objects. So that's a little bit of a mystery there. Um, other things they took, they took a lot of Rembrandts. Um, including a painting called Storm on the Sea of Galilee. It's the only seascape by by Rembrandt, and now it is lost. Um, And the museum offers a reward um, of $10 million. It's the largest bounty from a private institution that's ever been held. But to this day, the mystery is still unsolved. Um, And so you can actually visit the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum today, um, and they still display the empty frames on the wall. It's like this uh, very sad and haunting reminder, I think. Do you think they were after... A particular piece of art and they camouflaged it with taking a lot of things that's a great idea and that, that's that's a prob- probability right so grab this random eagle finial and things like that it's a possibility they've still a complete mystery they've had a couple of these with the boston mafia maybe um again using this thing as a currency in the, in the criminal underground but um yes no no nothing definitive yet I know there's been a couple of pieces that have been recovered. What do you think the overall percentage is of things recovered? And then on top of that, what do you think the chances are they're going to recover the items from Paris or Boston? Great question. Um, And I have a very sad response to both of them. (laughs) Okay, let me get my my glass. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, Statistically... Um, the estimates range from uh, 5 to 10% of stolen works of art are recovered, a very small amount. I think it is unlikely that these will recover. Um, it usually, it's, it's not uncommon for a couple of years to go by before um, stolen work kind of comes to the surface again. Um, so there is that prob- probability, but I'm concerned about the likelihood that these will, will reappear. So perhaps they were burned. I, I don't know. Or they did end up in a James Bond villain's lair. But 
when that villain dies, won't they come back? And that's happened a lot with Nazi theft art. That's where I was going with that, because the Nazi theft art, I mean, it's come back. Absolutely. It's been found. As that generation, the World War II generation is dying, people are going into estates and finding these incredible hordes of art that is not owned by them. Um, I think the the last case I can remember was one in Switzerland. Um, they came into this apartment and there was they discovered a hidden wall, knocked it down, and inside are hundreds and hundreds of incredible works of art, including Picasso's, uh, that hadn't seen the light of day for decades. Do they arrest the? I mean, great question. There's a lot of resources and um, organizations now that are trying to correct this, this this plague, right, of stolen art, especially the Nazi looting. So um, the FBI, for example, has a, a huge art um, theft crime task force that is um, responsible for investigating art crimes. Um, their their um, organization, right, is responsible for a lot of great. Uh, finds another good one. Uh, another great resource is called the Art Loss Register. Um, and so you would ask about images, right? They they have a huge database of images. All these things can be searched. Uh, the Ministry of uh, um, in Poland actually operates a large searchable database with art um, stolen during World War II, particularly from Polish collections, because Poland was one of the worst hit. And all of these things are searchable, and auction houses are supposed to do their due diligence and check these works against these theft databases to make sure that they've properly vetted it, right? Looking for that provenance and, and uh, trying to find who it truly belongs to. Conservative tens of thousands, more likely in the millions. One estimate says that 20% of Europe's art treasures was plundered by the Nazis. And so it's not just a Rubens painting in a museum, but we're talking about smaller things in private Jewish collections of religious objects, um, candlesticks, furniture. All of this gets ripped from its original owner, from its original context. And can you imagine the problem of putting that puzzle back together again? It's a nightmare. We didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones to take pictures. I mean, we didn't have polar. I mean, how did they have pictures? I mean, how did, I mean. And if we do have a photo from, say, World War II, it'll be some black and white image. Let's say black and white. And how do you prove that somebody didn't just make a replica? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a very sad state of things. But at least we got Tomek. <laughs> I have to say, after researching this case and talking with you, I can see how you could get. I now want to go and like do my little search on a couple of things because it's like all these little threads that need to be followed. I can see how somebody could get enthralled with art in the history and all of these things. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, returning back to our er earlier conversation, the, the arts, we need people who are interested in doing that kind of work. All right, looking at research and finding out the history of, of these objects and who they belong to. Museums need it, um, independent institutions, um, the FBI. I mean, so if anyone is interested in pursuing that line of work, um, there is a, a great need for it, to be sure. I think you should look at a podcast on stolen art. Maybe. With wine or with, with or without wine? I six say podcast <laughs> with or without wine and now, you've been to, I'm assuming, a museum or two. One or two, yeah. How many museums do you think you visited? <laughs> well, I haven't been to the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, you know, Tomek had been there and you wanted, you know. Now, Damn it, that Modigliani's not there. Would you say 30, 40, 10, 20? Oh, 100. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I enjoy going to museums. It's at, you don't necessarily need to know, you know, the, the complicated backstory of all these paintings. Just go and appreciate. Let's just go look and see what speaks to you. I mean, kind of like Tomek. What right? you feel, what your you feelers. Feel. And that's a great place to start learning about art and making it a part of your everyday life. For somebody like me, except for I'm going to go to Paris next year, if you could suggest, we'll just say three museums, what would those three be? In Paris? Anywhere in the U.S. Oh, anywhere. 
Uh, okay, in Paris, I really like the Musée Carnivalet. It's the Museum of the City of Paris, like the, the history of the city. Um, it has an incredible collection that it, I think is neglected compared to the big ones like the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay, paintings that tell the story of the city of Paris. And Paris, right, is a major capital for human history. And <laughs> I mean, all the histories of the revolution are told through paintings. Fantastic collection. And it's in the middle of a, a Renaissance era palace that it's, it's beautiful, right in the heart of Paris. Um, another favorite museum is the Getty um, in Los Angeles up on a hill um, with this great encyclopedic collection. Um, so the views can be beat both inside and I outside. have been there. Oh, I have been to get. I've been to the Getty, and they have some incredible exhibitions. A, a great calendar, um, and also a great research library too. If you are interested in doing it, it's actually on site and open to um, the public with permissions. Um, and a third, um, I'm going to have to go with the Met. It's ah, who a great couldn't museum. go with the Met? It's it's you could you could spend a lifetime in that museum. So. I have not been there. So that that's on my bucket list. Good. Good. That is on my bucket list. If you enjoyed today's episode, please take a moment to give us reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or I am happy to announce we are now on the Himalaya app. You can give us reviews on your favorite podcast app. Also, I would love to hear from our fans. You can also connect with me directly on our Facebook page at True Crime and Wine Time or at Twitter, Terry True Crime. If you would like to support True Crime and Wine Time, you can join our fan club at patreon.com slash true crime and wine time. We have several tiers available. This helps keep the wine flowing. Our episode today was researched by Terry Dusol, edited by Phil Dusol. Our theme music is by Atta Gold, and our special guest, Sean, would you like to say anything? This was a lot of fun. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, the wine and the crime talk. Um, and something I, too, I want to tell your listeners, too. Um, I've been impressed by the amount of research that you put into each episode. I don't know if your listeners are aware of the scope um you do original primary and secondary research um you you talk to me at length about all of the archives that you go into and you find original ideas and um yeah keep up the good work it's impressive oh i do we've got to put a lot i mean i have to put a lot of research into this it's my secondary job but you have to yeah. there i mean it Take it from a historian. I'm I'm impressed by your re level of primary research. So the amount of articles I find, the Washington Post, Seattle. I mean, we're talking big name publications, and I have the ability to pull up crime files. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not what was said in court. How do you publish that? I go off the court, and sometimes that's what I have to say. There's multiple things. And looking at investigating that ambiguity and you know contradiction, that's important. No, that's good. It's that little thing that I have to follow. Sure. It's like I got to do it. I got to do it. So yeah. thank you for listening to True Crime and Wine Time. Until next week, stay safe, watch out for crime, and enjoy wine time. <laughs>